So first, let us start with a broader question to, to frame the topics at hand. So what do you understand when we talk about access to platform data and how important is this topic in the broader discussion about internet and human rights? So it's a more establishing questions uh, uh, for, for initiating the conversation. Okay, so what's the, what do I understand by access to data and why is it important? Um, for one, I think access to data is, as a topic is a much broader topic than the DSA conception of access to data for researchers. So if you ask me, what is access to data for researchers? It's access to both platform and company governance information, but also functional information plus access to information about users' conduct or the kind of use that the platform uh, receives. So it has two sides in my mind, and it can serve mainly two, two purposes. One is to understand how, how this huge internet companies, which are the main targets for access to data for researchers, um, how they handle, organize, manage data that they have and how they organize, manage, and deal with their own structures, what rules are in place, how they go about their own processes, what processes they have set. Um, that's important data for researchers, which is not yet fully transparent. And that's one side of it. That goes to the claims for transparency, for accountability, for understanding a little bit better how companies operate, what they do, what they don't do, what they are responsible for, what they are not responsible for. And notice that I use the word responsible and not liable. Because um, I think there's a, there's a gap in understanding there that I think it's important. And the other side of the coin is users and conduct and what happens on these platforms. And that's another kind of access to data. That's the kind of access to data that we have been scrapping so far. We've been trying to find out how people use these services, what's, what kinds of actions they perform in these services, how they game the different systems that are out there, um, what potential for good or evil these companies may have. And this, Second part of the coin is interesting from a number of perspectives, from a sociological perspective to better understand how societies are changing due to these platforms or these um, innovations and technology, to understand better what kinds of issues affect our, our societies when we're discussing an increase in hate speech, for example. What are we talking about? Where? What kinds of hate speech? What? what what are these platforms telling us about those phenomenon? Um, and that can be really useful to understand policy, to understand needs, to understand how our historical policies um, have worked so far. A lot of the societal issues that we're trying to, to get a better understanding of online are societal issues that precede the internet. And there are already policies in place that, that need to be reassessed, reevaluated, and that probably need to change, but we're not sure how. And I think this part is pretty important. So I think in defining what I understand about access to data, I already touched upon why I think it's important I think it's important for 
evidence-based research, for evidence-based policy, for a better understanding of the different phenomena that are out there, um, that are affecting our societies, our democracies, um, in, in many different ways, to understand what kinds of remedies we may think um, we may think about in light of this on one side. And on the other, I think data access for researchers is really important to find liability schemes that work to provide the right incentives to, to protect fundamental rights and be able to find necessary and proportionate measures to address whatever harms or whatever threats or challenges may be out there, but also to find accountability in a system that currently is lacking a lot of that. Thank you so much. I think this question would be awesome for the rest of the interview to give them the framework for assessing all of the questions. And, and then uh, the next one is, it's a dig in in the DSA. So uh, the question is, starts with, how do you explain uh, to non-Europeans what, what the DSA uh, rule about data access to researchers? And given that the DSA address, addresses many other issues beyond, beyond that, how do you see the place of these provisions alongside the others, uh, alongside this? So how you, how you fit uh, um, the access to data in the DSA? Uh, and of course, uh, if, you, if you may, uh, we would love to hear what do you think are the important regulatory choices that you see as relevant in the European debate? And what do, so how you explain how they faced the problems that they faced and how this fits in, in the DSA. Of course, is a, is a summary, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you don't need to give all, all the details, but, but like, what's your understanding about it? So how does this fit within the DSA? So the DSA is an interesting policy experiment so far. It's an interesting regulatory experiment. Um, that's, that's what we know so far. And the regulatory experiment is targeting a couple of different issues, but um, a main objective of the DSA is trying to generate accountability for large online platforms mainly, but also for smaller ones, um, for online risks and potential harms. And the kinds of risks and potential harms that the DSA is concerned about are risks and harms mainly to democracy and to the European legal um, framework. So there are two main concerns or two main categories driving the DSA um, as an effort to provide more accountability for, again, mainly very large online platforms. That's how they the DSA calls them. It's VLOPs or VLOPs. Um, and the, the, the whole framework is associated to a certain definition or perception of risks. So one one point of entry to the DSA or one main clarification for non-Europeans and also for Europeans is that the DSA is not a process oriented regulation. It has a lot of regulation of processes, but it's it's not content neutral. It's oriented to certain kinds of risks, to certain kinds of contents that the European Union is concerned about. Having said that, how does data access for researchers fit within this very broad system that they have created with the DSA? It's one article, it's article 40, and it provides for data access for vetted researchers for relevant research that they may want to perform on 
platforms. So there are two key provisions there. One is vetted. You need to be a vetted researcher to be able to access this, this benefit that is granted by Article 40. And the second thing, the research that you want to do needs to be relevant research for the purposes of the DSA. And this takes me back to the risk part. So the way Article 40 is built into the DSA goes very much in line with the explanations that we've heard from European authorities in the sense that they are envisioning the DSA to be a regulatory dialogue and not necessarily a piece of set norms or regulations. So what they're thinking basically um, is that compliance with the DSA will be checked through different means. One mean will be through direct enforcement and through reporting to the European Commission. Um, and this is this is a first. So they are going to submit transparency reports and reports on concrete information that the European Union is, is asking of these platforms. And the requisites vary depending on whether you're a very large online platform or you're not a very large online platform. So very large online platforms will be monitored directly by European Union authorities and smaller platforms will probably have their implementation and enforcement distributed through the different national authorities. And a lot of this is to be taken with a grain of salt because they are defining the implementation of this law as we speak. So there are a lot of things that are not yet set in stone. But the whole idea of a regulatory dialogue, the way they're envisioning it, is that nothing or very little of these um, regulatory mandates is set in stone. The idea that they seem to have, and this is my understanding, um, is that by granting data access to vetted researchers, the research that is produced through that use of Article 40 is going to come in and feed into the regulatory and the monitoring and the implementation side of the DSA. So while it may seem like a research, um, like an academic kind of um, access, the, the, the bottom line, the objective that is built within Article 40 is that that research serves to inform policy and serves to inform the way that the DSA is interpreted in its main terms. How do we interpret risk? How do we interpret uh, proportionality? How do we interpret necessity? How do we interpret due diligence? How do we interpret impact in the sense that the DSA um, is envisioning this terms to be? So Article 40 fits into the structure as an implementing technique, as a monitoring technique, and also as a, as a more academic or um, as a as a pre-tool, a way to a way for the European Union to be able to induce into this whole process um, new evidence-based policies that may not be in place or built into this framework yet. Did Perfect. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Uh, and I think that the discussion about, around finality would be very interesting for, for developing during this project. So it's, it's, a, it's a key insight. So now we're going to leave Europe a bit and, and enter another um, part of the interview. So in recent years, the global public, public discourse on platform regulation has often taken the DSA as a major reference 
In Brazil, as you may know, the this, this so-called fake news bill proposes to regulate social media platforms and its most recent version creates mechanisms expressly inspired by the European legislation. And among others, a key question that is always present in regulatory debates transposed to other realities is how to understand the role and power of state. As we know, authoritarian experiences in Latin America, for instance, raise a range of, con of concerns on how regimes could use the legislation to concentrate power and control the flow of information. So before we get specifically into data access to researchers beyond the European context, uh, the Latin American characteristics in contrast to European contexts that you may emphasize when we think about platform regulation being discussed in the region. Okay. So a very broad overview of the Latin American characteristics um, that are somewhat singular uh, in thinking um, in thinking of a base towards platform regulation or platform accountability. Um, I think there are a couple of there are a couple of things to point out there. Um, one one main difference um, of Latin America regarding other other regions or particularly Europe or the United States is a pretty pragmatical kind of issue. Um, geopolitically we don't have the same standing as Europe or the United States as a region. And that has many explanations. It includes the size of the market. It includes the kinds of platforms that reach our region or that become popular in a region. It includes the kinds of the culture, the communications culture that we have. It includes historic reasons of how our media has, our traditional media has been um, historically organized. Um, there are a number of differences um, that characterize our own region. So in thinking about platform regulation in the way that the DSA is being thought of, um, that's a that's an interesting thing to take into into account. The other big thing is that Latin America is not a homogeneous kind of region. It's a very heterogeneous kind of region, um, and that's that's uh, that's lucky. I think we are very diverse in a number of different ways and a very rich region. But when thinking about platform regulation of the sort that a region like the European region can think of, where you have 20 something countries associated under the same structure and within the same framework. Well, when we're thinking about a Latin American regulation of uh, platforms, that needs to be taken into account um because it wouldn't be one latin american regulation it would be a bunch of latin american regulations um and a bunch of regulations that are coming from very different countries smaller ones bigger ones um more democratically stable less democratically stable uh with a longer democratic history and with a shorter democratic history and that has a huge impact in how we think about monitoring, supervision, compliance, um, viability, interjurisdictionality. How are our requirements going to work with our neighbors' requirements? Um, how are they going to dialogue? How are they going to interact? Um, so that I think is really important. The other thing is we have, as you said, a history of authoritarianism in the region. We have a history of um, very strong presidential regimes in a region. Um, 
that usually tend to impact in the kinds of supervisions or in the kinds of regulators that we can think of. So think of the DSA and how they are thinking about independent regulators. That is something that in many countries in Europe has worked, but in many others have not. Um, now translate the idea of an independent regulator in the way it's conceived in Europe and translate it to the Latin American region where we have heavy presidentialisms and where we are not necessarily famous for our rule of law uh, or, um, or a balanced distribution of power among our, our, our different powers. And there, what, what I find um, is that speaking of an independent regulator in a, in a lot of countries in Latin America is like speaking of a blue dog with green stripes. We have never seen one. And that is something that should be taken into account. Same thing when you're thinking about a parliamentary commission to rule over platforms. Have you seen any parliamentary commissions that have worked in our region? Because I haven't. And I've seen many attempts at it, but unfortunately they don't necessarily work. What has worked has been Constitutional courts, the constitutionalization of our of our different uh, fields of law. So we have seen heavy a heavy constitutionalization and a heavy internationalization of our domestic legal regimes, and a high permeability of international human rights standards within our local legislations. And that is something that is interesting and it's kind of unique when you look at other regions in the world. The impact of our inter-American human rights system has been quite unique when you compare it with, even when you compare it with the European um, human rights system. Um, and that, has provided our region with interesting and strengthened guarantees for rights such as freedom of expression or privacy. It's not casual that intermediary liability protections in our region are heavily associated with human rights, with freedom of expression, um, and not necessarily with business law uh, arguments. And it has developed through our constitutional rights and our fundamental rights litigation angle and not from a commercial or less, don't allow me to say no, but, um, but to say to a lesser extent in a commercial, um, in our commercial uh, setting. So I think that provides a unique context within which any sort of proposal for platform regulation must be anchored when you think about um, Latin America. So let's talk about how, I, how we should anchor this. Uh, so among the myriad of differences on how to understand access to data by researchers around the world, one of the most complex and controversial ones is what researcher is and what it should be. In the Brazilian debate, for example, defining what researchers are has proven to be a complex task, disputed by several sectors and stakeholders and provoking discussions about what should be including the, the role of, of the state. So in your opinion, what are the best and the worst ways to conduct this conversation? Should this category of researcher also include journalists with data mining or visualization skills, or should be restricted to people with an institution 
uh, institutional affiliation to universities? Should there be some kind of accreditation or vetting process by a regulatory body, by an association of peers? So what a researcher is for you in this framework? That is a very large question. Um, a little bit of context that I think is necessary in addressing that question is that our university structures and our academic and our research history in Latin America is quite different from, from other regions as well. For one, we have a lot less funding than other uh, regions for research um, in some ways and a lot more funding in others. And what do I mean by this? A lot of the, a lot of the bigger research facilities across the region are state funded research facilities in our particular region. And this kind of happens in Europe in some countries, but I don't, I'm not sure if it is to the extent that it happens in, in Latin America. Um, when you think about universities in Mexico, universities in Argentina, universities in Colombia, universities in different countries in this region, there's a heavy, there's a heavy state influence in, in a number of those of those countries, particularly on the research units and on the research funding. So the state is a big funder for, for research and a really bad funder for research in a number of ways. It pays, research doesn't really pay in a lot of countries in our region. So that creates an interesting baseline <laughs> that you need to work with. Um, other than that, uh, there are few research institutions in, in Latin America. Uh, particularly if you think of research institutions in the traditional ways uh, that you would think about a research institution in the United States or in Europe, an institution that has the funding, the ethical standards and the structure to guarantee those ethical standards uh, around research. Uh, institutions that have capabilities top-notch technological capabilities of doing large-scale research like the one that presumably is going to be demanded by data access for researchers um, according to Article 40 of, of the DSA. But on the other hand, a lot of the institutions that would have those conditions and, and that technology and the funding don't necessarily have the research agenda. It's not the same people that have been studying technological issues and society and technology so far in our region. So there are two sets of institutions, the few institutions that would have the infrastructure, the technology and the funding and the institutions that have been studying these issues for the last 25 years. And those are not necessarily the same um, currently. So that's a problem. And that's a problem that relates to how do we define a researcher? And this question is not exclusive for us. Uh, the Europeans have been thinking about who do they grant researcher status too. And a big question is, are civil society organizations researchers? Are think tanks researchers? Would Internet Lab be considered a researcher? Um, the other question is, one is civil society and the other one is journalists. Are journalists researchers? And if so, which journalists would be considered researchers? Would any journalist be considered researcher? And then you get into a mamushka kind of question. What is a journalist and how do you define a journalist? So you can go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into, into these questions. And for a lot of very valid reasons, um, 
A journalist is a person that practices regularly the right to free speech as their uh, trade or profession. That's the way that the inter-American system has defined a journalist. So it doesn't necessarily require a degree in journalism. It doesn't really require an institution behind it. It doesn't really require an accreditation of any sort. Uh, in fact, there is a requirement that states don't impose um, restrictions to practicing journalism. So I don't have an answer here. I do have a way to give the question a little bit more complexity. Um, if you ask me, I don't think I don't think the relevant part of the question is on who you consider a researcher. I think the relevant part of the question is how do you vet them? How do you vet access to these people? So it can be anyone, but what will it take for those anyone's to be considered vetted in the same sense that the DSA uh, was drafted and in the same sense that I've seen the, the provision migrate across borders. So there is some requirement, you need to accredit something before you're granted access to, to this data. And there, a little bit of complexity, but no answer. Um, one complexity is what kinds of technical requirements are you gonna ask for um, as a government? So as a government authority, whether you create an independent body to assess um, who can be vetted and who cannot be vetted, there are certain conditions that you need to set from the, from the get-go what kinds of infrastructure will be needed to guarantee, for example, data protection? Uh, what kinds of technologies are you gonna be requiring from the people uh, that are trying to access the data? What kinds of protections um, to that infrastructure are you gonna be requiring uh, in order to, to grant this kind of, of data access? And on the other side, a side that the DSA gives a lot of importance to is what are you going to consider relevant research for, for, for vetted researchers? So in order for you to be vetted, you need to meet certain conditions um, that are technical, that are related to infrastructure, that are related to security. And then you need to have your proposal be approved for relevance. And how are you gonna consider what is relevant and what is not relevant? And there, just one piece of advice um, or one very broad stroke at a guideline, this cannot be in the hands of one state regulator. Um, and going back to my question, we have yet to see an independent regulator in this region. So this cannot depend on a so-called independent regulator, depending on the executive and the, the way we have seen those um, deployed in our region. Can it be, you asked whether it could be a commission or an independent body or something of the sort of that sort, right? Yeah, about like the peers uh, making the vetting, for example, other academics. Okay, that's that's an interesting idea. It would really depend a lot on what peers are you going to consider. Are you going to consider civil society organizations among peers? Are you going to consider academic institutions among peers? Are you gonna consider journalist associations among peers? Um, and then how are you gonna consider state funded research or journalism or, or even civil society? Um, let's not forget that political parties are civil society organizations. <laughs> um, so let us bear that in mind that that 
piece of information sink in for a second and think how are we going to deal with this different actors that don't get me wrong they are they are legitimate potential applicants for this kind of data i want the state to have evidence based policies so i think there's a, there's there's necessarily the question is this article thought of as the one that grants the state a tool for evidence based um, research should that evidence based research be conducted by the state or should be should be independent and now we get into another mamushka so i'll stop here great and and you already uh answered the next one so we <laughs> have more just more three because the next one was about um the resources that we as latin americans have to deal with that and the asymmetry so you already talked about that so the, um, the next one is, um, is the following. So the research center that you lead, Sele, has recently made an argument that access to data channels opened by the DSA should also be accessible to non-European researchers in some situations. In addition to explaining a little bit about this argument about cross-border access to platform data, how do you think that the data access established by the DSA could impact or influence countries outside the European Union? And of course, what are your expectations about how the European Commission will interpret uh, the, um, the Article 40 of the DSA? Okay. Yes, we have made the argument that Article 40 should benefit um, institutions, researchers um, outside of the European Union for a number of reasons. Um, for one, European authorities are publicly claiming that they want this to be a model for comparative regulation. So they want to export this model. Um, and I think if you want to export this model, and this is the experiment that you're basing your, your exports needs on, it might be a good idea to give researchers um, access to data to see how it, among other things, how is the experiment going? Um, and what kinds of evidence um, can be found? Um, second, a lot of the a lot of the language that is behind the DSA and that is also behind data access um, for researchers is language that is that has been building over the last decade. And it's related to transparency, transparency for sociological reasons, transparency for accountability reasons. And one of the natural characteristics of, of platforms of the internet as, as a technology is that it's a cross-border interjurisdictional technology. So a lot of what we see happening in other regions with technology, with policy is impacting other regions of the world where uh, those policies are not necessarily being um, directly adopted. So that's that's a second argument, sort of the how the impacts of policy um, are cross-border as well as as the technology. Um, the other thing that sort of ties the the two previous ones together is that there's a certain claim, to trying to evaluate and trying to diagnose how the information ecosystem has been affected by technology. And I think that's a very valid question that's at the root of at the root of accountability, at the root of transparency, at the root of policy efforts that we have seen over the past um, 
five years at least, I think there's a very poor understanding of the impacts of technology on the information ecosystem. And when we think about the impacts of technology in the information ecosystem, unlike what we did 30 years ago, we're not thinking of our local information ecosystem. We're, look, we're thinking of a global information ecosystem um, because the technology is interjurisdictional and because the policy that is being adopted in different countries has extraterritorial impacts, uh, whether directly or indirectly. So what we have seen lately is a heavy asymmetry between evidence-based research on the information ecosystem in the global north, in Europe and the United States, let me put a name to the two regions that where most of the evidence-based research is being produced. Um, and a huge gap with the rest of the world. And this has an impact in the way we think about technology. It has an impact in the way they think about technology. It has an impact in the way we think about policy. It has an impact in the way we can anticipate um, the impacts of technology in this information ecosystem. Um, for better or for worse, a lot of the priority setting around this information ecosystem, this international information ecosystem is, is global standard setting, is global um, diagnostics. And that global diagnostics is not happening in majority world countries. It's happening in Europe and in the United States. And it's happening there in part because of this asymmetry in evidence-based research. So I think it's in the interest of the European Union countries to, in order to better understand it, the information ecosystem, the migration of information across borders, the impact of technology in that information ecosystem, it is in their best interests to incorporate a trans-European vision of this particular provision. Fourth and final point and argument um, that I would make is that the asymmetry already exists and Article 40 of the DSA has a potential to bridge that asymmetry, to help or contribute to bridge that asymmetry and a, a potential Conversely, to amplify that asymmetry exponentially. And I think it really depends on, on where we land on this question from the get-go to go in one direction or the other. So I think it has a huge potential for good and a huge potential for big, big, big exponential damage in creating this huge magnified asymmetry of evidence-based research around this information ecosystem that I think is more global every day. Thanks. Um, yeah, it, like we, we really wanted to uh, picture and portrait uh, your, your argument on that. So it was a perfect explanation. So we have two more questions. I think they're a little bit Quicker because they they are about specifics on on data access to researchers. So you already um, you already mentioned one thing or another. So so uh, be comfortable for responding uh, more quickly and referring to other answers. Uh, so the first one is that like the creation of data access mechanisms by researchers raises a number of concerns. 
from data protection and user privacy to research ethics. In your opinion, what should be taken into account uh, on that in terms of mechanisms to mitigate those concerns? Uh, to what extent, for example, data protection authorities, eth ethical boards should be involved? So the question is, is there a homework element that countries, including Europe, must take care to ensure its researcher its researchers access uh, to data and that that this to work for the intended purposes that that the legislation has. Short answer: Yes, I think there's a homework to be done. I think the European the European authorities are doing that homework as we speak. They are conducting meetings with well-known, well-established academic centers that have a history and a tradition of doing complex research. Um, they are getting the information that they need, um, mostly to set what the requirements are going to be. So if you're asking for anonymized data, what kinds of technology should, should they ask for or aspire to? Uh, what kinds of guarantees should they, um, should they set as, as a minimum standard or as a, as a minimum parameter? What is realistic? What is not realistic? What kinds of um, systems should be in place within the institutions that receive this data um, from an ethical point of view. Um, an alternative that they are working around is creating intermediaries that can receive the data and researchers can apply to those intermediaries. And there's a couple of options that are, that are happening there. Um, but it's certainly a a number of complex conversations that need to happen. And when you look, this is something that I really like about the Europeans. I don't like it when they export their regulation and don't necessarily ask before exporting. Um, but I love that they prepare their regulation and they 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 really take their time and and they think through what they are, are proposing and doing. So the DSA was a two and a half or three year effort in dialoguing and conversing and, and whatnot. And it could be more transparent. Yes, it could have been more transparent. But overall, it was a serious kind of um, process that led to it. And the implementation is also being conducted in that way. And I think, Here's an invitation on my part. Whoever has the capacity to participate in these dialogues and is interested in participating in these conversations and thinks that has something to contribute to these ongoing conversations, European Union authorities are holding a number of these conversations and I invite you to, to join them um, and I'd be happy to connect or to serve as a clearinghouse for information on, on what's um, happening there. We're trying to track how those conversations are going and we're trying to actively participate there. I think any country that is thinking of adopting legislation of this kind should be thinking about their own kinds of homework, um, making sure they know, they know what the national environment looks like, what national, uh, what the universities locally can do and what they can do, what civil society looks like within their own um, countries, who could be interested in this kind of access to data, how should they be thinking about these kinds of articles within their own borders, within their own region, we're going to do this invitation to uh, a bigger audience. So we, we expect actually that uh, we have some dialogue with Brazilian researchers, for example, and to expand this, this discussion with them. So the last question uh, is about which data. Uh, some researchers often report 
uh, having difficulty conducting research because each platform makes different types of data available in different ways. Other researchers imagine new data sets, maybe more qualitative in new fields and about new products or systems that uh, never were data was produced about before to the external audience. And on their side, platforms say that data interoperability or even an extensive menu of data would be cost prohibitive. So what should be taken into consideration when deciding, when deciding what type of data should be made available and how platforms should make them available? It is possible or desirable to develop mechanisms to standardize the type of data uh, across platforms uh, or not? I think that's an interesting question. I've been pushing a number of colleagues of mine that have been talking forever about transparency to, to give me a more clear idea of what they meant by transparency, transparency over what, um, and for what purpose, because the kind of data that you would get when you ask for one kind of transparency or when you ask for another kind of transparency would be different. If you're asking for transparency for accountability purposes, for access to data for accountability purposes, you're probably going to be focusing on data that um, has to do with company handlings and company processes and um, company standards. Um, if you're talking about the impacts of technology on society, you're probably gonna be talking about personal data of users. And that's a different kind of data. Um, and in dealing with the different kinds of data, you need to, you need to think of different processes and different standards. We were talking before about the kind of homework that you need to do before you adopt this kinds of legislation. Well, depending on the kind of data that you're thinking or envisioning, this rule to, to give you, the homework will probably be different um, and it would look very different. Um, I think the DSA has in linking the entire regulation to risks and harms. And I started with this. I mentioned the DSA is not content neutral. They are concerned about specific risks and specific harms, even though they speak a lot about process because they're looking at process vis-a-vis -vis those kinds of risks and those kinds of harms. Um, I think they, they have somewhat already answered some of these questions. Um, still, it's an ongoing conversation. Let me just add this. The discussions around Article 40 of the DSA have opened a number of very interesting conversations and varying models for how this thing could be applied. And in looking at the richness of the conversations that have arisen, I would I think that I think this is this is a question in and of its own. There are a number of of, of different initiatives that are that are out there. And they're thinking of an entire new ecosystem being built under Article 40 to deal with different kinds of access to data and to different kinds of data. Um, so I think there's that that's a, that's an another open question. Um, and a question that I think that I think should be answered collectively. I mean, I I, I can have my opinion, but um, I think there's a conversation there that we should have. Great. Uh, I think you're right, my opinion. Uh, Agus, I really want to thank you about that. Uh, I know that many of those questions are super difficult and deep and dense. Uh, but 
as I told you, the idea is to kind of kickstart a more meaningful conversation about the DSA here and in our regulatory discussion in Brazil, because people are quoting the DSA without quoting all of these, all of these discussions that are occurring in in a more detailed level, as you as you mentioned. So it was super interesting to hear you. And I think this is super helpful for the process for the project. This is the first one, this is the first interview that we did. So it was well, a good one for setting the stage for the project. Thank you so much for the invite. Um I really appreciate talking about this, you know that uh, we are, we're engaging with a number of um, initiatives that are thinking about data for researchers and how to implement Article 40 